My name is Monanum. I am an acquaintance of Wampanoag. As we have every fourth Thursday in November since 1970, United American Indians of New England and our supporters have gathered on this hill to observe a national day of mourning. Today marks the 41st time we have come to this hill in all kinds of weather to mourn our ancestors and seek the truth about our history. Those who started National Day of Mourning could not have envisioned that we would still be here year after year carrying on this tradition. Many of the elders who have stood on this hill and who organized the first day of mourning are no longer with us, but we feel their spirits beside us today. United American Indians of New England declared the U.S. Thanksgiving Day to be the National Day of Mourning in 1970 because my father, an Aquino Wampanoag man named Juan Soda Frank James, wanted to speak truth to power. Juan Soda had been asked to speak at a very fancy Commonwealth of Massachusetts banquet celebrating the 350th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims. He agreed. When asked by the organizers of the dinner to provide an advanced copy of the speech he planned to deliver, Wong Sutta agreed. Within days, Wong Sutta was told by a representative of the Massachusetts Department of Commerce and Development that he would not be allowed to give the speech. The reason given was that, and I quote, the theme of the anniversary celebration is brotherhood, and anything inflammatory would have been out of place. What the state was really saying is that, in this society, the truth is out of place. The organizers even went so far as to tell Wong Sutta that they would only be allowed, or he would only be allowed to speak if he delivered a sugar-coated speech written by them. Wong Sutta refused to have words put into his mouth. Instead of speaking at the banquet, he and many of hundreds of Native people and our supporters from throughout the Americas gathered in Plymouth on this hill and observed the first National Day of Mourning. What was it that got those state officials so upset? One study used as a basis for his remarks one of their own history books, Mort's Relation, a pilgrim account of their first year on Indian land. What really happened at the first Thanksgiving? According to popular myth, the Indians and the pilgrims sat down and had a wonderful dinner Everyone lived happily ever after the end. Well, here is the truth. The reason that the myth makers prefer to talk about the pilgrims and not an earlier English-speaking colony, Jamestown, is that in Jamestown the circumstances were way too ugly to hold up as an effective national myth. For example, the white settlers in Jamestown turned to cannibalism to survive, and that's not a very nice story to tell kids in school. And the pilgrims did not find an empty land any more than Columbus discovered anything. Every inch of this land is Indian land. The pilgrims, who did not even call themselves pilgrims, did not come here seeking religious freedom. They already had that in Holland. They came here as part of a commercial venture. The Mayflower Compact was nothing more than a bunch of white men sticking together to ensure that they would get returns on an investment. They introduced sexism, racism, anti-lesbian and gay bigotry, jails, and the class system to these shores. They were no better than any other group of Europeans when it came to their treatment of the indigenous peoples here. And no, they did not even land at that sacred shrine down the hill called Plymouth Rock, which is a monument to racism and oppression. Upon first arriving, the pilgrims opened my ancestors' graves and took our corn and bean supplies. Massasoit, the great leader of the Wampanoag, knew this. Yet he and his people welcomed and befriended the settlers, little knowing that before 50 years were to pass, many Wampanoag and other Indians would be killed by their guns or dead from diseases. And from this very harbor, the English invaders would sell my ancestors as slaves for 220 shillings each. The first, national, the first official day of Thanksgiving was pro proclaimed in 1637 by Governor Winthrop. 
And he did so to celebrate the safe return of men from Massachusetts who had gone to Mystic, Connecticut to participate in the massacre of over 700 Pequot women, children, and men. And about the only true thing in the whole mythology is that these pitiful European strangers would not have survived their first several years in New England were it not for the aid of the Wampanoag people. And what Native people got in return for this help was genocide, theft of our lands, and never-ending repression. Now, some would ask what we have gained by observing National Day of Mourning since 1970. Well, the very fact that you, or all of you are here, is perhaps our greatest gain. We have brought people together from the four directions who want to join the struggle to destroy the pilgrim mythology. And that first day of mourning and also was a day of action. In 1970, Plymouth Rock was buried not once, but twice. Yeah. The Mayflower was aborted, and the Union Jack was torn from the mast and replaced with the flag that had flown over liberated Alcatraz Island. The roots of National Day of Mourning have always been firmly embedded in the soil of militant protest. Now, that first day of mourning was a powerful demonstration of Native unity, and today is a powerful demonstration of not only Native unity, but the unity of all people who want the truth to be told and want to see an end to the oppressive system brought to these shores by the pilgrim invaders. Now, I'm sad to report that the conditions that prevailed in Indian country in 1970 still prevail today. We continue to demand an end to federal interference in the affairs of our native nations. This was a demand in 1970, and it is still a demand today. When will native nations be free to govern ourselves? And how dare the corrupt bureaucrats of the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, sit in judgment of who is native and who is not? And how dare they tell some Indian people that they are not real Indians? Yeah. Yeah. Those who started National Day of Mourning in 1970 spoke of terrible racism and poverty. We all know that racism is still alive and well. And our people are still mired in the deepest poverty. We still lack decent health care, education, and housing. Every winter, thousands of our people have to make a bitter choice between eating and eating. Our youth suicide and school dropout rates, our rates of alcoholism continue to be the highest in the nation. As the economy crumbles around us, these conditions are only worsening. Today, as we did in 1970, we mourn the loss of millions of our ancestors and the devastation of our beautiful land and water and air. We pray for our people who have died during this past year and during the past 500 years. I hope you will join me in grieving, too, for our sisters and brothers in all countries human beings who are referred to by this government as collateral damage. We remember all too well that our people throughout the Americas have for centuries been the collateral damage of the European invasion. And I hope you will join me in grieving, too, for the immense suffering of our sisters and brothers in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Palestine, in Iraq, all human beings who suffer and face on a daily basis acts of terror. And we remember, too, the hundreds of millions of people who are hungry today, whether they live in Boston or in Port-au-Prince or Gaza. And we condemn all acts of violence and terrorism perpetrated by all governments and organizations against innocent civilians worldwide. We condemn the racial profiling and detentions that are being directed towards our Arab, South Asian, and Muslim sisters and brothers in this country. Since the invasion of Columbus and the rest of the Europeans invaded our lands, Native people have been virtually nonstop victims of terrorism. The slaughter of the Pequots at Mystic, Connecticut in 1637, the U.S. military massacres of peaceful Native people at Wounded Knee and Sand Creek and so many, many other places, 
the armed assault by the FBI on a peaceful encampment at Pine Ridge in 1970. The very foundations of this powerful and wealthy country are left by the theft of our lands and the slaughter of Native peoples and the kidnapping and enslavement of our African-American sisters and brothers. And the U.S.-assisted terrorism against Native peoples continues in all too many countries throughout the Americas. Those of us who were here in 1997 will never forget what happened to our peaceful march. After a year of struggle, we were able to reach an agreement with the town of Plymouth. Part of the agreement called for the town to erect two plaques, one here on Coles Hill to honor Day of Mourning, and another in Town Square to honor Medicom or King Philip. We dedicated those plaques at the 1998 National Day of Mourning, and I am happy to say that finally there are two rocks in Plymouth that speak the truth. Thank you. The placement of these plaques does not end the need for us to continue to come to Plymouth and speak the truth. We will continue to come to Plymouth and protest as long as sports teams and schools continue to use racist team names and mascots. We will gather together on this hill until the U.S. military and corporations stop polluting our mother, the earth. We will continue to stand here and protest until racism is made illegal. We will not stop until the oppression of our two-spirited sisters and brothers is a thing of the past. When homeless people have homes, when immigrants from Mexico, Central and South America are no longer targeted, when no person goes hungry or is left to die because they have no access to quality health care. We will never stop coming to this place until police brutality no longer exists and having a job is a right for all. Until then, the struggle will continue. And do so in a country that continues to glorify butchers such as Christopher Columbus in a country that glorifies slave-owning presidents such as Washington and Jefferson, and even carves their faces into the sacred black hills of the Lakota. But we have a lot more to talk about than the pilgrims or what happened in the 1600s. We will also be speaking today about conditions in Indian country today. We are here to unite people and to speak the truth. Our program will only be native speakers. This is the one day when we speak for ourselves without non-Native people, so-called experts, intervening to interpret and speak for us. We are more than capable of speaking for ourselves. Now today, for a few hours, we are gathered here in liberated territory. Our very presence frees this land from the lies of the history books, the profiteers, and the myth-makers. We will remember and honor all of our ancestors in struggle who went before us. We will speak truth to power. We will remember, in particular, all of our sisters and brothers, including Leonard Peltier, Maria Abu Jamal, and Oscar Lopez Rivera, who are caged in the Iron Houses. In 1970, very few people would have given any thought to the fact that the indigenous people of this hemisphere do not look upon the arrival of the European invaders as a reason to give thanks. Today, many thousands stand, us, stand with us in spirit as we commemorate our 41st National Day of Mourning. And to our Native youth, I say, learn about and remember what your ancestors went through to bring you here. We are like the dirt, like the sand, like the tides. We shall endure. Now, in the spirit of Crazy Horse, in the spirit of Medicom, in the spirit of Geronimo, we are not vanishing. We are not conquered. We are as strong as ever. Hold. <laughs>